to dive today into something that's near and dear to my heart, and that's stick shyness, which is a common issue I see in modern goaltending. We're also going to dive into a little bit of background on the legendary Ty Domi and a story that you probably won't believe. As well, we're also going to take a look at what it means when I say chasing the silence. Stick shyness for me is a term I coined to describe the resistance of most modern goalies to actively and intelligently use your stick to help keep pucks out of your net. Now it's said sometimes that the best save a goalie's ever going to make is one they don't have to make. And that's where your stick comes in. And whether it's a product of teachers not teaching it, coaches not coaching it, maybe coaches didn't have it in their skill set so they don't feel comfortable teaching it, but the ability to use your stick appropriately besides stopping pucks is a key for high level goaltending and it's what you're going to need if you want to rise up in the goaltending ranks. Here are some basic examples of goaltenders that exhibit stick shyness. The first one would be cutting passes. When a guy passes the puck through your limits, which we'll talk about here in a second, and you don't attempt to cut the pass with your stick, you end up getting a guy on the back door with an easy tap and goal. Now the announcer is going to go, oh, the poor goalie had no chance. The guy was wide open. But in that case, many times goalies can get a stick on the puck before it gets to the receiver in front of the net. If we're aware of the play, we can intelligently anticipate it. You might even ramp it up in the guy's mouth. And I can tell you, the guy's not going to score if the puck is ramped up in the guy's face. So one example of stick shyness is when goalies don't cut passes. A second example of stick shyness is when goaltenders never never or rarely poke check. When I watch Patrick Kane come in on a breakaway, it's likely going to be an automatic goal. But one thing we do that could help us is use our stick either in a fake poke check or a real poke check. Because if you don't poke check or the, the player knows you have no attempt or no likelihood of poke checking, they're going to bring the puck right into your feet and then do their deke. And if they can bring it in that close with impunity, they're going to make you look stupid. Now, is a poke check going to be successful all the time on a high-end player? Of course not. But it's going to make them think, and once in a while, they're going to mess up. I remember a time when we were playing Philadelphia Flyers, when I was coaching with the Toronto Maple Leafs, and, and Matt Sundin had a penalty shot, I believe on Roman Monik. And he came in, and Roman Monik gave a great fake poke check, and he was known as a poke checker. And Matt Sundin, a Hall of Famer, dumped the puck in the corner on a penalty shot messed up. Now I'm not saying overuse your poke checks, overuse your fake poke checks. I'm not saying trying to cut down every pass you can by lunging and being aggressive with it. I'm just saying be intelligent with your stick use. Cut passes where you can, use your fake poke checks, use your real poke checks, make people aware that you might use your stick. If you're known as a passive guy that never uses your stick, you get victimized. Once in a while you make that heroic backdoor save, but more times than not, if you can prevent the puck from getting to the dangerous guy in the first place, you're going to be far more successful. Let's take a look in detail on three situations I'm talking about when it comes to active stick and not having stick shyness. Number one would be cutting the pass. Here's a perfect example of a scenario I see all the time where goalies exhibit stick shyness. Puck's over in the corner. There's a backdoor guy wide open here, standing. Goalie's hugging the post. And the goalie will let the puck come right through tight, and this guy will make an empty net tap in. Now, we need to know our limits. And basically, the limits are how far you can reach your stick out at the shoulders without extending it to the paddle, past the paddle to the knob, but just that distance where you normally hold your stick, you reach out. That area there is the area you cannot allow a guy to pass the puck. And a general rule of thumb is the blue crease. You never let a guy pass the puck through your blue crease. Now, if you miss the puck, you still have to move over to try to make that save. And I'm not asking you to lunge with your stick and be aggressive with it. I'm just saying, don't let a guy pass the puck through here. Now, another example we see quite often is when you're on the PK and you have the net set up here. You have a guy over here on the back door, just waiting. Pass comes down to a man at the side of the net here and he takes this puck and he passes it right through 
the lip of your crease. If he passes it through and it gets to that guy, that puck is going in the net. And if you're standing not deep in the net, that's a pretty easy pass for you to cut. So cutting the pass is an example where you can be better at your stick shyness. Don't be crazy with it, but experiment with it in practice and really get good at cutting passes and not letting pucks pass through your blue crease. Another area where I see stick shyness is on deeks. So when a man comes in on a goalie, we've always been taught to play the Y3 where you challenge and you back up with the guy and then you slide one way or the other. Now when the guy's coming into deke, if he brings it right into your feet and suppose you're here now on your retreat and he starts deking right in here close, deke, 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 deke like the Patrick Kane thing, once he decides to finally pull it and shoot it, he's going to have an empty net to shoot at because he's not afraid of this area in here. He'll bring it in close to your feet because he knows you won't poke check. But if he knows you're the type of guy that might poke check, the threat that you might poke check means instead of bringing the puck here before he deeks, he's probably going to want to deke earlier and stay outside your poke check range. And that's a lot easier deke to handle if he pulls it earlier. So if you let a guy bring it to your feet and deke within that three foot region in front of you, he's going to score every time. Make him respect that gap and have good poke check presence so they've got to deke out further away from you. Now another scenario where I see this stick shyness that I'm speaking about is in this exact scenario where you have a man attacking, you've got your D and the guy's got your D beat and he's jumped through this gap here and the goalie will let the guy walk him straight across and tuck it in. And this guy normally brings it in really tight to the guy in that cut across in front. He's got pressure because there's D there and that's the time where a fake poke check or maybe even a real poke check from time to time works. I'm not saying every time. I'm just saying you can't let a guy with impunity walk that puck through that tiny little gap. Now if you have passive positioning deep on the goal line and you'll never take your hand off the, the paddle of your stick because you never poke check because that's the guy you are. This guy is going to cut through this gap every time and be doing empty net tap-ins. So on the off center deke where you got defensive help, a fake poke check or real poke check minimizes that gap so the guy can't beat you to the far side. You want to make sure you use that from time to time or at least let the opposition know that you might use it. I'm going to let you in on a little NHL secret not a lot of people know about. Those of you that have played in the NHL, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you that want to play in the NHL, this is what's coming for you. It's called chasing the silence. What do I mean by that? Something very unique happens. This is an auditory phenomenon that I want to explain to you. In the NHL, you have the lower bowl, you have the upper bowl, and typically, unless it's the Florida Panthers, it's going to be filled to the rafter with 18 to 20,000 people. In the year I played in Milwaukee, we had 18,000 people because we were trying to get an NHL team. And the times I played in the NHL, they were full buildings. Here's what I'm talking about. A lot of times during a game, a bing-bang play will happen, and a puck will maybe come through traffic, and you'll make a save where you know it's in your glove, whether you're just getting lucky or you made a great save, whatever. Here's the chasing of the silence. There's a microscopic moment in time where you as a goaltender know you have the puck, know you've made a great save, but nobody started cheering yet because they're not let in on what's just happened. And here's why that chasing the silence gives me goosebumps even today. When you make an amazing save in front of a big crowd, you know the cheer's coming. It's going to be a massive overflowing of sound and noise just just blowing your head off but when you've made that save there's actually a distinct amount of time where there's effectively silence nobody started cheering yet because they don't know you know they don't know and that chasing of the silence is living for that moment where you know you've done something great and the impending explosion of sounds about to happen and here's a second element that i guarantee you you've never even realized in the NHL and in big leagues, here's what happens. Same scenario, make that save, 
Nobody started cheering yet. But when they do, it's always the people over in the corner nearest to where you made the save that start cheering first. And it's amazingly loud. And then like a wave, it sweeps around the outside of the arena and elevates to the upper deck where an appreciable difference of maybe five seconds later, the upper deck at the far end starts cheering. It's a wave of massive sound that grows to a crescendo and ends in the upper deck at the far diagonal corner from where the save was made. So being in the NHL has got amazing attributes, as you know. But the one thing I know we all love is chasing the silence. That moment in time where there's no noise before the fans start, you know you've made an amazing save. They're about to be let in on your little secret. And then that corresponding wave around the whole arena, that appreciable delay, and those poor fans up in the nosebleeds in the far section finally get to cheer your greatness. That's why you play goal. When you rise up through the hockey ranks, through minor hockey, junior, college, and on to the NHL, you come across a lot of players in your journey. One of those players that I played against as a kid and was on the coaching staff of the Toronto Maple Leafs when he played there was Ty Domi. Now we all know his toughness, his eagerness to fight anybody, but I got a couple funny quick stories about Ty Domi that you're not going to believe. When he was 14, there wasn't a rule in junior hockey that you couldn't play as an underager. So he played junior B for the Windsor Bulldogs at 14 years old. He looked back then like he looks now. Big pumpkin head, short guy, greasy little smile. And he played back then just like he did in the NHL. So as a 14 year old, he challenged our bench when I was playing for Strathroy, he was playing for Windsor. He takes his helmet off, he calls out our 20 year old veteran and our 20 year old veteran eagerly obliges, jumps over the boards, starts to get his helmet off, and before the Strathroy player can get his helmet off, Ty Domi grabs his helmeted head. And with Ty's bare forehead, Coco butts him. Ty's bare forehead against the guy in Strathroy with the helmet on. The Strathroy guy immediately out to lunch, laying on the ground unconscious with Ty Domi's bare forehead. He hits our guy, he looks over at our bench, and he says, Daddy's home, who wants it? And everybody in the bench just tucked their head. Didn't want anything to do with Ty Domi. Fast forward to my years coaching with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Ty Domi, big star in the NHL, he was our fourth line enforcer for the Leafs. Now, if you're a fourth line enforcer, you don't spend a lot of time on the top line with Matt Sundin unless you're Ty Domi. How did he do it? Well, when he would get one of his rare shifts as a fourth liner, he wouldn't come off. He would drive Pat Quinn insane because the first line would come out, Matt Sundin would come out, the rest of the first line, except for Ty Domi, fourth liner, hanger on. He spent a good extra 30 seconds on the first shift every game by being Ty Domi and refusing to come off the ice. 